But yeah. hey man, if y'all watching on YouTube, welcome back to the Textual Talk. I'm your host HD, and we got Jermaine Murray with us today, the job father. He's trying to get, I think he's got close to 500 people into uh, tech, and I think he's probably what going into a thousand, if not more than that. Um, he's a, I don't want, I don't like the word tech influence. He's a, a pretty much prominent voice on Twitter, prominent voice on LinkedIn. Um, he is from Toronto. Um, and y'all gonna hear that when he talk to him. But uh, without further ado, let us, uh, I guess, introduce himself. Uh, thank you, thank you for 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 the uh, for the intro, HD. So uh, everyone, my name is Jermaine uh, Murray, but uh, like like HD said, J- Jermaine Jupiter or Job Father. Uh, I'm a recruiter and a career coach that's on a mission to help eventually a thousand people. Uh, but right now, but my next milestone is 500. Uh, black people get new jobs in tech. So you give her like a really short blurb. Uh, everything in the world is going up and salaries are stagnant and tech seems to be one of the few industries where there is a lot of opportunity and a very, very, very high ceiling. Um, a lot of my people, my age, I know a lot of people, my age that, um, are working in tech that make six figures. Um, and we were able to get those salaries after a couple of years in the industry compared to a lot of our friends who aren't making, uh, that much money working in other industries. I have friends that are teachers friends that are nurses, and uh, I low-key sometimes feel guilty uh, when I see the amount of work that I have to put in um, and like how much I enjoy my job and how much we get compensated for it compared to you know the fact that they work in, I think, more critical jobs that require a lot more passion. And I'm passionate about my job. I live, breathe, and eat recruiting. But like you have to have a critical function. You have to have a certain type of mentality to work uh, in the public health space and they don't get compensated the way they should be, you know? Um, so I, I find that we are very privileged in the tech industry and I want more people that look like me to also be able to, to reap the benefits because the rip, when you think of the ripple effects, like it could, uh, it could catch us up in a lot of different ways. I think you're on mute. Oh no, I, I was uh I just said definitely, but I had played that bit. But um uh, yeah, definitely we're gonna get into some of the stuff you said. Matter of fact, we might just flip everything because I just thought about something you said because I was quoting it to my girl earlier when um you tweeted, Hey, corporations that's making your employees go back into office, thank you, you made it that much easier for me. <laughs> Cause look, like I I just put on my, my Twitter, I was like you know, once the company said we had to start coming into the office, I spun the block on all the recruiters in my in my DM. You know, I mean, I really did because I wasn't really intending on possibly coming into the office and probably till like August. And now they're telling me that they just flip flop like so much on the uh, policy when it came to the shots. Like, I really feel like I got the honestly, I would have just not got them. I just tried to do the Kyrie and hair down as long as I could since mm-hmm. they, you know, were going to do that. But I was just like. You know, I, after being like not in the office in two years, I really don't want to go back. I don't want to do a long commute because I'm actually moving farther up north. So it's like, you know, what's the benefit? On top of, you know, I might bleep this out (laughs) for YouTube, but I I feel like I haven't even been adequately, you know, trained to just be up there. Like, I know how to make myself look busy, but I don't want to do that the times I'm up there just make myself look busy and I'm not busy. I feel like that's a waste of my time. But that, you know, that tweet sums up like 2022. Like, I don't think, you know, at, at one point, corporations had the leverage. They don't have the leverage anymore. I think it's um, like, I'll, I'll tell you firsthand, as a recruiter, the it's hard. It's hard as hell to be a recruiter. Uh, and that's why you see so many job postings looking for recruiters. Because uh, finding a good recruiter is hard. And even then, good recruiters are having a tough time in this market. The market is is totally in the favor of the candidate right now. And I think that tells you how healthy the actual industry on a whole is. Because we have more opportunities than we know what to do with. A lot of companies have a lot more funding than they know what to do with. And there's a lot more money on the table than we all realize. Um, so right now, like it used to be, when I first started recruiting, it used to be that like a senior recruiter, a senior Java developer, you know, with about five to like eight years of experience in Toronto would run you about 120000 right? Um, in 2022, you know, like about seven, eight years later, 
it, it's now like uh, a senior developer with five years of experience could easily be asking for anything from like 150 to 180,000. Um, and then on top of that, the money's not just the only thing. It's all the perks, right? It's the quality of life benefits, right? People like companies have, we've worked in the, in the pandemic for two years. We've worked remote in two years. We have the data that proves that not only are people happier, they're more, they're more productive, right? And your employees are more rested. Uh, that means that your culture is overall better and your retention goes up. You, you just make more money in the long run. So it, it makes my job easier as a recruiter, especially for somebody that recruits for an organization that is forward thinking, that cares and puts its employees first. It makes these other companies look like slim pick, like, like on, it's not slim pickings, but like um, I, I'm in a gamer group and we have this saying in this gamer group, uh, when someone's low on health, we say that they look chewy, which means that they look very vulnerable. They got no shields, nothing. And, you know, when I look at these, uh, when I look at these companies forcing their employees back into work uh, and the employees saying that they are miserable with that option, when I see companies uh, put up advertisements in their building saying things like, I bet you, you miss your dog or too bad you're not wearing sweatpants, antagonizing people. I know that there, I, like, I, I run a referral program with over 100 companies that are all remote, right? There are companies that are like, yo, we can make money remotely. And because all these other companies are doing such a bad job with just treating people with basic decency and respect, we just got to let them know that, yo, this is not an antagonistic uh, uh, in, uh, industry or position or company. Work here, you know, live your life, enjoy it, enjoy the fruits of your labor, and, you know, uh, be able to actually have a life, have kids, have family, have time. Time is priceless. And more companies are realizing that you get more value when you give people back their time. And if they're not, like, they're going to die off. Man, I can't believe you said they are acting like saying something like, do you miss your dog and stuff like that? I'm like, We had a, we had a, a office building in Toronto and this just kind of went viral. They had six signs up, right? And on the signs... Uh, one was a dog looking sad at a computer and it was like, I bet you, you miss your dog. One had just sweatpants and it said, I bet you, you miss your sweatpants. And then there's two others, but those are the ones that got a lot of heat. And the company actually had to go out within that same morning and take those postings down because of how angry people were. Um, you, you said you're moving up North, right? Can you, and you're thinking about your commute. Like I used to take the train into work. I always used to get sick in the wintertime because we are all sick. People on the are street. dirty. Pe- people are dirty. Right. I haven't, got, I haven't gotten sick in two years. Bingo. Me either. I don't want to go back to that. I don't, I don't, is, is that is because I think right now, if, and I could take the back streets in there probably 40, 45, maybe longer than that. It really depends, but that means I got to go to sleep earlier leave earlier and when i come home i probably not going to want to you know even deal with people because i've been you know gone the whole day uh not to mention they're like oh yeah you got to pay for your own parking why am i paying <laughs> for my own parking? when i worked in the office at my last job we didn't pay for no parking we just parked in the parking garage so all this stuff is you know red flags to me i was like no so what did i immediately start doing started back applying and they started back answering so you know they i mean I really don't care. After being laid off like what four years ago, I really don't have any loyalty but to myself. So <laughs> I don't really uh feel bad about leaving. Like, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I, I think overall the company I work for there, the people are nice, the culture is good. I just think because uh, I made the tweet as well talking about like the companies like that are trying to make people come in are like ran by old people. Uh, and yeah, I agree with that because that you should have an option. Now, some people want to go in the office. Like, you know, okay, cool. Hey, you can just come in one day a week. I might be okay with that. But mandatory three, choosing my own days is cool, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> you oh, you yeah. should say pay for your parking. and um, Or, you know, if that's the case, I didn't, before then, I didn't know that. I would just negotiate even more. And that's something I mean people can think about. They have to go in the office. But when you don't know, you got to pay for your, your own parking. Then it's like, oh, okay. Because I'm used to... Pe- Companies having their own garage where I don't have to pay for parking. Not to mention gas is high. <laughs> it's like a whole bunch of things that is like no, and 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 bigger companies are saying, "Hey, we're cool, letting you work remote." So I'm like, "Hey, you know, if you lose me, 
No, that was on y'all. Yeah. My full-time actually, employer. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Because I was going to say, like, the funny thing is, last week on the one-on-one, me and my manager talked about it, and it seemed like it was cool, I guess. He had to go talk to some people, and then we talked yesterday, and then he was like, yeah, well, they said, you know, basically they said by these rules, they they figure two two uh, shots is, you know, considered vaccinated. I was like, yeah, whatever. So they was like, yeah, so you probably got to start coming to the office. So I so know try to maybe come in like sometime this week. And I was like, can I just come Monday? And because I go on vacation next week. So I was like, I just do them measly three days. And, and that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm just going to pick two of them days and then say, oh, well, Wednesday is my day to be home. And then that's, that's what I'm going to do. I know exactly how I'm going to play it when I go on vacation. <laughs> Man, um, I feel for you because I'm, I'm thinking like uh, my full time employer, for instance, we actually bought an old, uh, old the old uh, an old office building and completely renovated it. Um, we have one of the best views in of like the CN Tower, which is our monument in Toronto. Anytime you see a Drake, like if you go on the views cover, that's, that's what he's that sitting on? on. That's the CN Tower. It's the uh, up until like uh, I think like two thousand and one. It was the tallest building in the whole entire world. Um, so it's a, it's a great monument of pride for us, right? We have a, this fantastic view of the CN Tower and the downtown core in our office. We have a balcony with bar, with barbecues. We get, we get free lunch, right? We have this awesome working building. They spent millions of dollars on it just before the pandemic started. And we had a choice. We actually had a vote. Like we had a vote asking like, do you want to go back to the office or do you want to remain remote? And they remember, this company just spent millions of dollars on this office. Everyone overwhelmingly voted to remain remote. And they're like, all right, we're going to stay remote. And if you want to come in the office, the office is there for you to optionally come in. Right? And pretty much the office can hold up to 300 people with the pandemic restrictions. And we have we usually have no less than like 150 people working out of the office. Right? They're still getting their money's worth. There's, the office is still there. And it's a great central hub. And I bring this up because I'm like, we're not the only company that's like this, right? So it's like, I hear you think about going back in the office. Honestly, if I was in your position, I, I'd be I, I'd be sending out my resume. Like you said, I'd be spinning the block on the recruiters. Um, I low-key might quit before I go back into the office. And right. I, a lot of people feel that way too. I don't even yeah, have yeah. kids or, or a dog. <laughs> right yeah yeah trust me i mean it, it happened and once they said that because i had already been i'm not gonna lie you know hey guys patreon talk uh we all know everybody been if they could and if they had the if that's at the level two they was running the bag up you know because truth be told i don't see the problem with you working two full times and, and some people doing that less than 40 hours a week and some companies want to get mad, but yet yeah, y'all will give us new projects, but not up our, you know, compensation. So I I did it briefly um, last year. And if I said if I would have, they would have found out about it, I would have told them my reasoning. And if that wasn't good enough for them, oh, well. But I'm just like, you know, you have to call out the hypocrisy. And we can't, can't act like they want to act like they're losing money if we're not in the office. First of all, it's still going to be some type of deduction for y'all during taxes. So it doesn't matter anyway. Y'all make too much money. Y'all have to do something with it. <laughs> like, I don't know who they, they think they're fooling with all this kind of stuff. But yeah, it's useless. Definitely. But to to get back on track, uh, to kind of for the people kind of um, know a little bit more about you. I read on your, your website, it said that, and let me clip this real quick. All right. I read on your website that you said you worked over 30 jobs, you know, mm -hmm. which is a lot. And then um, just start with that, the 30 jobs and actually what made you want to start like uh, Jupiter HR? Like, like how did, because I know that's like, I know like when I read that, I was like, wait, 30? Yeah, yeah. So I, I originally went to school, uh, university for broadcast journalism. And I wanted, when I graduated school, I said to myself, my goal is to be the Black Larry King, right? And I also didn't want to move away from Toronto. And traditionally, you know, if you are trying to break into media in Canada, and if you're in uh, Toronto or Vancouver, you have to go to like one of the smaller markets uh, to really like get your break and like start working on TV. I was like, I ain't trying to go anywhere. There's no Black people. <laughs> 
So uh, I was like, I'm going to force and try and make it my way here. Uh, so I used to pick up like uh, I was that was my main goal trying to trying to break into the radio industry. So I, I took up like any job I could to sustain myself at the time. A um, couple years into it, I wasn't able like a couple years into it, I wasn't able to break into the radio industry. The best I was able to do is that we got a my friend and I got a nighttime show on Sirius XM talking basketball. That was good for about a year. And then they canceled us, which was like it was devastating. Should have known, though. The show was on from uh, from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. <laughs> and we were just talking about about, about NBA basketball in uh, in Canada. And at the time, the Raptors weren't any good. So like, it was a hockey town. The writing was on the wall. We weren't going to last. And we were the only two black guys there. We weren't gonna last. We weren't gonna last long, um, but when that show got canceled, I said to myself, "I need to give myself some options," and I decided to try out different career paths. Um, I did everything from at first. At first, I was just solely in it for the money, so I worked anything that would have give, given me like a high salary. So I worked a lot of uh, manufacturer jobs. I worked a lot of. I worked like a lot of construction jobs. Um, I worked with my hands a lot. Um, I was working one time in a factory and I nearly passed out from like heat exhaustion. And this used to happen all the time. Hey, right. you ever done a manufacturing job? Uh, I didn't do manufacturing, but on my, like my adolescent years, um, yeah. my, I come from a blue collar family. Um, I used to do like, uh, concrete jobs, like my dad, and my uncle all the time. So I know a little bit about, you know, I didn't ever pass out, but I used to be beat by the time, you know. It was time to go to sleep. If you you know what always surprised me about 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 the about the temperature at those kind of jobs, it, it like we used to do in the summer, right? Especially like so I used to work through the summer and the winter, but like most I got like a lot of hours in the summer and I was doing shifts from uh at my manufacturing job, it was from four PM to four AM, Monday to Thursday, and then three to eleven on Fridays. And the thing that always surprised me and that made it hot. It was hot already and stuffy because there's no AC or ventilation in there, but the exhaust from the machines made it worse. Like your face isn't by the fumes, but when the fumes come out, there's heat that comes with it too. And that's what makes it like so muggy and hot. Um, so I used to pick up those jobs and drop them as soon as I got them. And like uh, my whole thing was if I didn't feel passionate about it, I was going to just suffer there because like the way my mind works, I, I, like every single hour would be excruciating. Um, I jumped from manufacturing. I did a lot of jobs in media. So uh, I was a videographer for, for a little bit. When you talk, we were talking earlier before the show about where we were when Drake dropped. Uh, if you're reading this, it's not too late. Um, I was covering, I was doing a documentary on a Canadian basketball league, um, doing a documentary on a team called the Mississauga Power, uh, trying to get my videography chops. Um, nice. Trying my hand at acting, you know. Tried my hand at sales. They didn't let you get in Degrassi. They didn't let me get in Degrassi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told him I knew Drake, but like in Toronto, every, every everybody knows Drake. <laughs> um, I, yeah, man. I, I even worked, I even did like promotions for like the Raptors for a little bit, but it wasn't anything big. It was just handing out flyers and being part of their their street team, right? Yeah. But um, I tried everything to break in, and then you asked me what led to Jupiter HR. I was getting really desperate uh, a couple a couple years into this search. I want to say like it was about like two years before I became a recruiter. So about like in like 2013, 2014, I was super just over it and I wanted it to end. Um, so I decided like I decided to like look up a resume writer and I went to this resume writer and he made me a six page resume for uh for a broadcasting job and it was just my broadcasting experience i remember i told you outside of school i was only i was only on air for a year and this man charged me 650 dollars for that resume you gotta remember i was broke at the time too you know 650 dollars was a lot lot. it's a lot of money um and this just so happened that this uh resume writer was down the street from uh, TSN, which in Canada is basically our sports, our sports network. Okay. So, you know, my parents were like, you just need to do the old fashioned thing and just walk into the office and hand in your resume. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I walk into TSM with this six page resume and I hand it to the secretary it was a nice Jamaican lady. And she's like, sweetheart, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm applying for the job here. She's like, what job? I was like, I don't know. Can you tell me? And she's like, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> that's not how any of this works. Um, and she was kind, but she ripped into the resume too. And she's like, she's like, you handed me, like I handed her like the little manila doc uh, folder. Right. And she's like, she's like, you hand me a book here. And, and, and she's like ripping into it. And she's saying it's too long. It's too messy. And um, I was distressed when I left the building, like, like, and she was being nice to me, but I was mm-hmm. distressed. And I remember thinking, um, I remember thinking I felt like I got totally ripped off, but I, I couldn't complain because like I signed the contract and everything for them to do the work. So I, uh, I started researching on resumes, started like le- teaching myself about resumes. And I started understanding not only how to technically write a resume, but how to holistically write one. And I always say like uh, a resume is like one of those weird things in the world that you might hear on like anime or those old Kung Fu movies where they're like your subconscious will bleed into the resume. I always looked at it as like, if you don't have a proper intention for what kind of story you want your resume to tell, your resume is going to be all over the place. It's going to be sporadic and and no one's going to be able to actually ascertain what value you actually bring and in what environment does that value actually shine. And it was like a light switch went off in my head. And I was like, all right. Um, I remember I was like, all right, I'm 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 gonna start writing my resumes from the perspective of if the hiring manager were to read my resume, what would the resume have to say to make him go, Come oh, on. this guy's gonna make my life easier if I hire him, all right? What does he need to know? And that made me think of the problems that the job was facing the problems that face the industry and like how I fit into that, like what, what different ways I could use my experience. Um, started getting a lot of different calls. Like it used to be like, it, it got to a point where I was saying in a resume and like 90%, I was getting a call back for an interview. Uh, my boy started seeing that. And he got you to like, do yo. his, huh? Yeah. They're like, yo, can you do our resumes? And I was like, I got you. They started getting called back. And then before I know it, the whole block knows that Jermaine writes a nice resume. Um, I start writing resumes for people. And that's how Jupiter HR first starts off as a resume writing company. Um, inadvertently, I built up a little bit of a network too. So I would have uh, like people, like small business owners around the area be like, yo, do you, do you know, you know, anyone that can do such and such, you know, anyone that can do such and such. And I'm like, I got everybody's resumes. So I do. So I made intros. Um, and then I was doing this for a couple of years. And I remember one day I was working at Enterprise Rental Car, managing one of their branches. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows this, but when you work at th- those like car rental places, the people that wear the suits are the people that clean the cars sometimes. Yeah. So they would have me in like the summertime weather cleaning these cars in the suit. And I remember uh, I had a very bad cleaning experience with some throw up. And I sat down and I was like, Whew. yeah, yeah. I sat down in the bathroom <laughs> after like, cleaning my suit and I was just like, yo, what do I want for my life? And I had this conversation that led me to uh, do a search with myself, figure out what I want. And then I ended up finding technical recruitment and realized that all the skills that I picked up so far was a good fit. And then I went in uh, through the agency route and the rest was history. Man, that's, uh, that's crazy. Cause uh, I know how I, one of the ways I did learn about writing resumes was, um, uh, when I was laid off, they hooked me up with the like the out uh, career people mm-hmm. with your career, and um, I learned like a lot from me, even in that that whole process. Uh, so that's dope, man. Uh, <laughs> the fact that you said, but that's crazy because I want to touch on something. Is like I I think people need to charge for resumes based on what type of job that person is trying to land. Sometimes people do a one price, one all, but if I'm doing something for an entry level person, it might not need to be five, six, seven hundred dollars. I don't care if it's going to, you know, whatever company. I mean, because most of the time they don't have that much experience. This might be a page, maybe a page and a half at most. I think like 
you know, the if you I got a director level person, C, you know, C level person, those people pay for the expensive resumes as they should because of, you know, how much, you know, compensation they're going to possibly get at those roles. So, you know, we know in the in these Twitter spaces or or Twitter streets as you call them, we see a lot of a lot of that stuff going on. And we'll get into that uh probably a, a little later. I want to get into I think well, you did state because I misstated earlier about you already had hired a 500, but I'm speaking into an existence for you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what type of like are these people? Uh, are they in all tech roles or are they in different roles? Or what what type of like I seen that you know you had them working like all different type of places. And do you only help people in Canada? Do you help in the U.S. too? Like you know, kind of give us a little bit of insight on that. So I, I actually help globally. Um, I want to say 90% of the people that I helped have been evenly split between Canada and the United States, but we also have some contacts in Europe, mostly in the, uh, the London, UK area, and like a little sprinkle in Germany. Um, and I got one person a job that, that was based in Jamaica at a global company. So I, I'd like to say that the attention is global, um, but most of the energy is, is in North America, uh, and the UK, um, Sorry, what was your what was the second part of your question? I had asked pretty much were they uh all like tech roles? Oh yes, yes. So they um they are all at tech companies. So I always tell people that you know you don't have to be a coder to work in tech. You know, there are other there are other things that you you don't you don't you um that other companies use. Um they use different languages, but the one I like to use for non-tech roles are enabling functions. Where like yeah the, the the engineers are building out the product but the product doesn't define a company you still need to have marketing people you still need to have sales people you still need to have implementation and training people you need to have people that do the hiring for you you need to have people that are, run the operations outside of the product um, so you find that like if you're working for Google like you still get all the benefits of working for Google right if you work at a tech company that's fully remote. It doesn't matter if you're working customer success. It doesn't matter if you're doing marketing. It doesn't matter if you're a developer. Everybody's going to be working remote. And that's the the type of companies right. that we're trying to get people in. Right. Yeah. Shout out to that. Yeah. That's what uh what Mary likes to refer to as board but paid. And um I, I like to start, uh tell people to go to stuff like, you know, if they can do it, if it matches up what they can, like they don't have to I found out like a lot of my clients sometimes are trying to reinvent the wheel a little yeah. bit. Where they're trying, they seen some on Twitter. Oh, I want to do this. I'm gonna do that. And I'm like, well, you're based on your skill set and kind of this. It may be easier for you to go this way. I was like, because I was like, sometimes they're trying to go the way I am. I was like, you can get this way, but it may take you longer based on background and on what you all have to know based on these interviews. Because um, a lot of people, I think, come to me to get into cybersecurity for one, and then I have a lot of people that want to become like SOC analysts, and a lot of them have the certs. But they are missing, they did the try hack me's also, but they are missing the one of the fundamental parts of it all is about like the thinking aspect of it. And that's kind of hard for a lot of people to do, but if you don't have experience with it, you really don't know how to, unless a company is going to take a chance on your character, which can I happen. Always... Oh, let's go. sorry, go ahead, buddy. No, I was going to say, I was going to say it can happen, uh, but and I think in today's you know threat outlook, it's probably less likely because of. I know for a fact cyber salaries went up over the past two years because of all the remote work, all the other threats, you know, that start, you know, emerging just from that because a lot of companies weren't prepared for that. So that's why you do see an influx of people like that's why they're trying to go there. But I was like that. It isn't the only way because like you said, other jobs. And I think all jobs are important, like no matter what, because we all support the business. And if people are kind of remember to put the business first, they'll probably be successful with just about any role they do. Because a lot of times people think they just work it and forget why you work it or what's the reason what's the you know the reason behind your position? What is it what is it, you know, based on supporting? I always say that with tech, and the reason why I love tech so much, it's not what you know, it's what you can produce. And like I gotta I gotta echo what you said in terms of like I I my too, I have a lot of clients that come to me. And they say they want to do X, or they want to do Y, they want to do Z. And, you know, I asked them why they want to do that. 
And then I asked him why again. And then I asked him, you know, if you were to, if you were to work, do the exact same job that you're doing right now and work for a company that gave you ABC, would you be looking for a job right now? And a lot of times they tell me no. Uh, sometimes they tell me yes. And it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm completely burnt out. Like this isn't the career for me. I'm not happy. Um, and that's, you know, and those are people that, you know, are, I, I always say like, okay, you got a long road ahead of you because your road is going to be filled with learning projects and consultations. So you can build like, you know, build up your rep, get your stripes and be able to produce in an environment where you're like, if something's going catastrophically wrong and your adrenaline's rushing through your body, you're not going to be able to rely on like theory. You're going to have to rely on muscle memory because you're going to be scared shitless. So until you can get to that part and produce at that level, you know, these are the steps that you have to take. And they understand that they have that road. And then there are other people that are just, that are in it for the quality of life aspect. And neither way is wrong. You, we, you know, you don't have to be super passionate about your job, but you should be passionate about your life. And if your job enables you to live a life you want to be passionate about, are you really losing? Right. Right. And so it's like, you sit down with people and they're like, I just want that quality of life aspect that a lot of people in tech seem to enjoy. And then it's like, you know, here's the path where of least resistance, where you can leverage all your transferable skills because mm -hmm. people can see how you can produce from the jump. Right. Definitely. And uh, sometimes I tell people, a lot of times some people have never even thought to like network within their own company they're at now to try to see if they can volunteer for some stuff and, you know, pretty much get a good report and see if like they could be brought on doing something else. Like you said, they're always trying to, you know, to go different routes. And I made a, I also made a video about like, you know, do you have to be passionate in it? And I was like, no, I was like, depending on what you do in tech, like you said, it's going to be filled with a lot of training, a lot of learning. And I don't think some people know that. I don't think they know that, Hey, like a lot of times we have to work, then we come home, be with the fam. And now we're studying for a cert or we're learning these new things. Like, maybe every couple of months or weeks, you know what I'm saying? Where you really sacrificing time, but you're trying to one stay current with the market and just get better. So in case something goes down, you're more marketable. That's part of this game. That's not in like some other, you know, other type of career fields. And a lot of people don't speak on that. I, I see people just promising, Oh, you know, get with me. And, and, and it's, I, I don't know, man. Like for me, I mean, you've seen me do it. If I don't necessarily call it. hate for it. <laughs> right. But also it's like, I'll, if I see somebody saying something that goes against what I believe for as like the integrity part of like getting into a different career, I'll always challenge them on it. And it necessarily just to bash them, but like, you know, we finna just bring up all the Twitter stuff. Cause I mean, you deal with like clients and probably heard some like, wild things that they said based on what type of money they say they possibly want to make. But, you know, people coming in, telling people who are newbies and, and that, that's the thing. The entry level space is the toughest one. And I try to help out as much as I can in that space because I've had clients that they went to somebody else that's ripped them off or whatever, you know? So I try to do right by everybody. So if somebody says, Oh, Hey, do this. And I can turn you into a scrum master and blah, blah, blah. And then you have people that's actually scrum master say, no, that's not true. And I'm saying, where's your proof of this? And I don't get the proof. You know, everybody, you know, is trying to say, you know, maybe you're the bad guy or something. Say, no, I'm just not like, because what I found out is people will just be quiet and just let stuff still go on. Say, no, nah. if you say something, just like we see now, every time somebody exposed my, everybody get courage, just, just say it then, but let it be based on something. Don't say it just because you, you know, you're hating. It's a clear difference between asking a question and just saying stuff because you feel like some, you know, not right. And it's not nothing that's based on anything. Like I, I, I don't like that. I, I I was in a, I don't know if you was in that space the other day when they was talking about uh, Makita, but I started leaving because then they just started throwing unnecessary shade to people that didn't have anything to do with it and just a mind of their own business. And, you know, unfortunately this tends to be the women that do this on Twitter all the time. Yeah, I said it. You know, if y'all watching this, you know, y'all can at me, but I, I see it with y'all all the time and y'all could be so much greater if y'all stop arguing. I don't see, you know, the men doing that at all because that's really not what we do. So, yeah, y'all need, if y'all kind of want equality, stop doing that.
<laughs> Sorry for that little soliloquy, but that's that's a little bit on on, on what we'll touch on maybe uh, later on about some of that stuff. But that's kind of why this is like they've called this the Great Racist Nation. Everybody is trying to get paid, which I tell people all the time. I don't care. Get your money. That's why I even reacted to the the mentions I got from Twitter and put it in a video because I was like. I get it. <laughs> you know, they told a, a, a person who came from, you know, a blue collar family that I was speaking elitist. Like I said, you know, you don't deserve to do a job. I, I put the definition in the video. I was like, no, I just said, learn how to do it. And then you can get the job. So to what doctors and everybody else does in med school or whatever, they don't just, you know, graduate and go work on you. So, you know, that's enough of that tirade. <laughs> No, no, I think I think you hit a couple of points that I, that I agree with in terms of like, uh, it does bother me when I do speak with people and they they leveraging no experience, they, they want to, they think it's possible to make like a, a six figure job um, with no experience, just straight into the industry off of a couple of weeks of a boot camp. Um, and so and that that has happened before in the past. Don't get me mm-hmm. wrong. But, but it's I an anomaly. See that it's an anomaly and I always, it's an anomaly where it happened way in the beginning when certs were first a thing and like the, the market wasn't so, um, wasn't so saturated. Right. Um, I always like when I work with my clients, I don't, I don't undersell uh, how challenging it's going to be. I, I, in, in some cases they might, you might think I might talking in a hyperbole, but like, I like, I, I, and a lot of my peers, yes, we, we like, you know, we do make good money, but it's come after like years and years and years of being in the industry, right? It, like even when I even when I first started, like my first recruitment job started me off at a salary of fifty thousand with commission, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I was a high performer, and even then, I, I it was still hard for me to break that six figure mark. I didn't break that six figure mark until a couple of years ago, and right. like I'm already like several years in my career. I encourage people to, I always encourage people to get into tech because a six figure salary is still an anomaly in the grand scheme of things in America, in North in Canada, it's, it's an anomaly, right? So there is a huge benefit in coming into tech because I genuinely believe that the, the barrier of entry to making a six figure salary is considerably lower than other areas because of just how high the ceiling is, but that's still a business decision for an organization to make your, your job search and your application is a, is a, is a sales pitch at the end of the day, you're trying to convince us a stranger that doesn't know you until you're working for them, that you can do the job well. And if you don't have certain qualifications, or if you don't have certain things or experiences on your resume, you're not going to be able to make a convincing sales pitch. And, and that's, that's what it really is. Um, some industries like anything, data engineering or data science, Hiring out in the Bay, yeah, they'll make six figures, but then they're working in the Bay. Right. Six figures don't go far in the Bay. So it's all perspective and, and context. Yeah, definitely. It's it's just, you know, it's just a lot. I just think this social media culture has made a lot of, you know, things unrealistic. And it goes from everything from men's wants to women wants. They just see people on there saying stuff for for people to click on. And that's, you know, that's why that happens. But I encourage you to, uh, you, man, by the time, I don't know when it's dropping. <laughs> but honestly, if you go back and uh, see a tweet, if you want to, like a, people, I'm pretty sure you probably been reached out to about being a mentor. Uh, yeah, people reach out to me about being a mentor. But so far, I really only mentored, Truthfully, probably two people, but the latest person is, you know, my guy, Dave Cyborgs. I talked about Dave probably about every podcast, but it's because he put a thread out either yesterday, two days ago, about how he went and approached me or different people, maybe on LinkedIn on that, and how, like, I replied back to it. And I was telling them, like, I was sharing it because Dave Spring had already showed me some value before even messaging me based on I had peeked out his profile when he was doing already. And, you know, decision was easy for me to respond to him. And then we just, you know, start talking from there. I was like, so if that's the route you want to go through, because that can also help you if you're trying to transition into a different career, like try to find people that are in that field that you want to um, use LinkedIn for that. And we're going to actually segue into 
how important is LinkedIn in the job search process now? Because I, earlier you talked about the old fashioned way and you went and saw the secretary, but we know now we do have, you know, the equalizer and, uh, and LinkedIn. You know? So what's your take on LinkedIn right now? So my take on LinkedIn is that, um, sorry, my Thank take on, on, on LinkedIn is that, so LinkedIn is necessary because uh, the whole entire job search process is a, like I said, it's a sales process. So it's a exercise in perception, right? Right. Um, it looks weird if, it looks weird if you submit a resume and I can't find anything in terms of a digital footprint from you. My default is to go into is to go to LinkedIn. If you're a developer, I'm looking for a GitHub. If you're a writer, I'm looking for your blog. If you're an editor, I'm looking for your reel, right? I'm looking for something else to confirm what you said to me on paper, partly because of the sheer volume of people that I have contacting me and applying, uh, but also because of the fact that I have um, I also have like, it's expensive to hire people. It's expensive to interview people. It, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of energy, a lot of time and a lot of resources away from like the, the stuff that actually generates revenue. So I have to be super careful and mindful when I'm, when I'm putting people through my interview process, because if I'm wrong, it can be a waste of time. Uh, so with all that said, if, like I said, if you don't have that strong, that strong sales pitch, that strong value proposition, we're not going to be encouraged to, to like, to reach out to you. Um, and it's, it's not because we're stingy or anything like that. It's, it's just an execution thing. Um, I always say, don't be caught up in what the next person is doing, but you, that doesn't mean that you don't do what you can to show your, your, put your best foot forward and leave everything on the table and, and getting your story right, getting your application right. And being able to like help people identify where your value is will go a long way. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Because that's one of the things I talk about, you know, I ain't quite my book up so long on here, but in my book is about branding yourself, about how me personally knows like how much everything has went up in my life after just branding myself on, you know, like you said, you brought up a blog, I got a blog, got a YouTube channel, got this podcast. I make, post every so often on LinkedIn, you know, thought provoking post that will welcome somebody to come challenge what I said and, and vice versa, or I'll go challenge what you say. Similar to what I do on Twitter, but just a little bit more professional. All those things matter because people do get a, get a glimpse of seeing a little bit who you are. And that's the reason, another reason with the, with the uh, YouTube channel is, you know, for even for clients that want to book me, a lot of times they say, Oh yeah, I've, you know, I've been following you on YouTube for about a you know a couple of months now, and I really like you know personality straight to it. And so that's one of those things where you can really kind of see you get you know what you're getting when they meet me. And so that that aspect of it is you know spot on. And I like to add, like I asked the uh, interviewer today, the one of the positions, uh, which I can tell you when we get off here, whatever. But um. Actually, you know what? I'll say it on here on, on the podcast, but it's a it's a, a Fang company. And it's probably the first company everybody thinks about when you say Fang. Uh, I have been talking to this okay. recruiter over, over since like the last week. and um, But the job has said it's supposed to be like in Herndon. And I was like, hey, I know they want to, uh, they had already sent me stuff, but they want to interview me and stuff like that. I was like, can you make sure they're good with uh, somebody being remote before we go? We waste time because I don't like my time wasted. I know they don't want to waste their time. And she was like, good news. They said, yeah, it could be remote. So like you said, I'm, you know, conscientious of like, hey, we both got busy schedules. I don't want to waste nobody's time. It's not like I had another phone screen today. Um, you know, I've already said this in uh, my last video about like, don't lowball yourself when it came to like, are you scared to negotiate your salary? And that might be something I want to ask you about too, to see if it's lining up with what I put in my video. But you know, the guy, he tried, he, I want to say he tried to be slick. He could have been honest. He was saying they didn't have a, a, a number or whatever for the, whatever they want to pay for the role. And so I just flipped it on him. I asked him about, well, in the past when y'all hired for this, what they had, he was like, he didn't really know. So I was like, well, based on the market and everything else, I'm seeing, you know, a range of a minimum of at least this. And I had them submit it. So 
I know some people may not have the confidence to put that number out there because they might say, oh, you said that? And I was like, man, listen, that's low compared to what they sent in my LinkedIn messages. <laughs> I'm just telling them at a minimum of, you know, what I what I may or may not go. My mind might change the next day. But I would like to ask you that uh, being that you work with a lot of black people, hiring, helping, you know, hiring them and probably helping them with their salaries. Have you found it? to be that they are less likely to negotiate? I think that for a lot of people, it's hard to, to negotiate salary because money money itself is is kind of hard for people to, to discuss. Um, and I think this is kind of like old conditioning from like generations of how employee and employer relationships used to be. Right. Um, so I do think that there is some initial difficulty because a lot of people just like the first thing that a lot of people are afraid of is that the offer is going to get pulled uh, if they counter or they, if they push back. Right. And that is a fear powered by des- desperation. I've been there before. I right. talk about my first recruiting job. I took 50 K. I, I was trying to, I wanted to, I wanted to hear 60, but I was afraid that they were going to pull the offer. And I'm going to be honest with you as being somebody that's, that's recruiting and on that side of the table, I always like, you always realize that it's easier for some to find somebody that the team wants to extend an offer to that will accept because there's a reason why the team hasn't accept extended an offer to anybody else. So that's issue. That's, that's issue number one, I, I would say. So like everyone expects you to actually push back on the offer. So a, they won't rescind the offer. If they do, that's a red flag. You didn't want to work there yeah. anyway. Give the deuces. Um, Yep. Yep. You just dodged a bullet. Uh, and B, they expect you to push back. Like they will always try to, like, and this is why I tell people don't give ranges. Just give, just say I'm targeting a salary of X. They will always try to get you at the lower end of the salary because that's, that's their job, right? It's all part of the game. I like to say, um, to talk to, to, to kind of touch base on what you just said, HD, I hate, I hate when recruiters do that. I, I I hate it. Could be recruiters that I'm talking to, or recruiters that I've that I on on teams that I've worked with. I hate anything that's not transparent around pay. Like like don't be don't be fucking with people's money. That's my right. whole thing. That's right. that's like the most important thing. Um, I always take the stance of I like you as a candidate, and I like you as a person. If I like you as a candidate because you can do the job technically. And if I like you as a person, I want to do everything possible for you to be excited. If I put an offer in front of you, right. I'm going to tell you from the jump, this is me. I'm going to tell you from the jump, what the salary range is. I'm going to tell you from the jump, how they go about leveling. I'm going to tell you from the jump, you know, what, like whether or not your, uh, your ask could be something that's uh, for priority sake, fair to the other people on the team at that level. Right. right. And then I'm going to ask you if you want to proceed knowing all of this information, right? Cause the way I look at it, it is hard to tell the hot, hot, fine people. If you hit me up and you're like, you know, we extend you an offer. That means you pass all of our technical tests. That means I don't got to go looking for another person. Right. That means I could, I could focus on some other shit. And there's a lot of shit I could focus on, right? But I got to fill this role first. So, wh- like, I, whenever, like, and it's funny because whenever candidates come to me with, uh, on like salary calls, and like, th- there's always like a little bit of like, and it, this is throughout my whole entire career, it's always been like, there's always a little bit of hesitation because people are afraid to like say the number. And then I got to, and then I got to tell them, like, yo, I want you to tell me the number. No, no range, no bullshit. Tell me the number that you need in order to make this make sense, because I want you to work here. Right. You tell me the number, I will take the number back to the powers that be, and I will fight to get you that number or as close as I can. Because at the end of the day, it's not my money. Facts. <laughs> That's facts. <laughs> right. And I mean... And this last role is like, you know, I negotiated. I got more than what they was offering. And um, because the recruiter that had already told me, say, hey, yeah, they'll, you know, negotiate what you want. You know, you'll get it. 
or whatever. But like I said, we was talking earlier. I was like, shoot, I probably should have negotiated some more. I didn't know I was going to be going working in the office, you know, this fast. And uh, I told the story about my friend, you know, about the whole time. And I, that's why I was saying, like, it do help. If, if you're interviewing somewhere at a company and you know somebody that worked there, hopefully you can reach out to them and they can say, oh, yeah, we just did the quarterly call. The company did good. They got the money. I was telling them the whole time, hey, they got it. You know, don't shortchange yourself. Because this going to you know possibly dictate what you get at your next role if you know whatever you're going to do, and that's also like why I think like LinkedIn is cool to be updated and stuff like that. Because now whoever I'm talking to, they can't just come in there and sell me some number that's dumb because they see who I work for. And so you could tell me something, and I was like, okay, this is not even worth my time. So I've been realizing that I don't know if they've been, and you're a recruiter, so you can tell me if I'm right on this or not, if they've been looking at my profile and saying like, oh, you know, this, this offers, you know, X, Y, Z, because now what people come into my DMS with is more than what they used to come in my DMS with. And it could also be because it's 2022, but I think it possibly has to do with my new job title as well. Uh, I mean, so it depends. It, it actually depends more on the company than the title, I would say. Okay. So like, it, the reason why you you're probably getting more, I would without seeing your without seeing your DMs, obviously, I would say it's more because it's 2022, because you have stupid recruiters that will send you an offer for less money for a three month contract, despite the fact that you only work permanent your whole entire life, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because people just aren't paying attention and they're like copying and pasting. So I, I would say the the when people when recruiters are paying attention. They, uh, they, they kind of can figure out, you know, based on your love, like your title it plays a part, obviously gives us context, but also like the size of the company and like where the company is positioned in the industry. A software developer too from Meta is not going to be the same as a software developer too from Joe Startup with 50 people, right? The scope is going to be different. The type right. of risk that the, that they're going to be responsible mm, is going to be different. So like, and a lot of, and that's where I say like, that's, that's why I mentioned earlier, like I'll tell candidates what the, what the scope is that I'm working with, but I also tell you them like how people get like, I'll just tell them that like the company is going to level you throughout this whole entire like exercise. They're going to see how you're performing the interviews and they're going to, they're going to look, they're also going to look at context of your resume and research on the places that you've worked at to see what the sizes are and how comparable the work is and then give you a level that they feel is fair compared to the rest of their team, right? And a lot of companies are doing that for, for just pay parity's sake, right? Uh, to address the number of inequities. Uh, right. And they try to keep it up with the market, but the market's the market. But at the end right. of the day, that's kind of where it's coming from. So I know that I know that if, I have, if I'm looking for a junior developer, I can't be looking at mans that have senior developer, senior software developer in their title, especially if they got like eight years of experience. There's someone's that if I'm looking for like a, like if I'm looking for like an intermediate developer, I find that intermediate's the most gray area of all, right? Uh, a low intermediate can be a damn near junior, and a high intermediate can be a damn near senior, and <laughs> sometimes it, it comes down to like the company's own internal values as to what dictates a senior. For right. uh, for some companies that I've worked for, the difference between an intermediate developer and a senior developer is how wide their deployments have been historically. Have you deployed to a user base of over a million? I right, then you were senior. Have you deployed to a user base of under, but you can hit all these technical benchmarks and all these algorithms? I right, you're a high okay. intermediate, and we're gonna ramp you up into a senior, right? Uh, but I feel like that transparency is is what sets up the conversations on whether or not they're gonna be successful. Because if 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 I like your profile and I have a job that's lower than what you should be getting, I'll tell you like, yo, I like your profile. I'm, I found it because I'm recruiting for this job, but I don't think it's a good fit for you right now because it's junior. You strike me more as senior. Here's your job description. If it, if I'm wrong, let me know. I'll be happy to t- take a call with you. But um, would you be cool if I hit you up in the future if I get something more at your level? Yeah, I've had that give you, before. You know what I'm saying? And that, that's the right approach. They give you an option to look at the job and you yourself can assess whether or not you're interested in it. And if not, like they got a connection. They can hit you back when they get something more appropriate. Cool. I think that's my last recruiting tidbit I was going to ask you about is like, how do recruiters, how how do we combat ghosting? 
Like, I understand it's a big job pool and everybody's trying to hire people, but, you know, like, I made a video on it, like, you know, think about it, like, put me through three or four interviews at one time, waking up back in the day before, you know, video interviews, you're, you're going into office, but, you know, your Sunday's best on, you know what I'm saying, the decency to wake up, show up early and go interview and don't have the decency to say, well, hey, you know, we decided to pass on you. Like, not even two sentences, you know? Like, how do does that like come from companies uh, straight down be like hey you know whatever it is send some feedback I don't care if there's two things because like I posted something I was happy one of my clients didn't get a role but they sent a good feedback I was like that's excellent you know exactly what to work on next time like because a lot of people are struggling just because they really deal don't know what their issues are when it comes to their interviews and if they could tweak them they'll find something eventually but if you don't know, now you're sad you didn't put your all into a job you really wanted. They ghosted you and and you, you're nervous, you're just not as confident. It's just a lot of stuff that go into those, you know, like you said, them desperate times when you don't have a job and you keep on getting done the same way. Yeah, it's so the unfortunate thing is, is that it's unique to every recruiter, hiring manager and company on different levels. Like some companies from like top down We'll, we'll have a line on, on feedback, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't give feedback or, or we do. And some companies are in the middle where they leave it up to the discretion of the people involved. Um, if someone does a if someone does an assignment or a test for me, I always try to get them feedback or at least give them, I offer them an opportunity to schedule a 15 minute call to discuss feedback on why they're not going through. Um, but a lot of times it's also like an execution thing. Like when you're dealing with that many people, you just don't have time in your schedule. Um, it's not right, but it happens. Um, and that's like the company side of it. Now, talking to P- if I'm, I'm talking to you, the, the listener, as a, from one job seeker to the other, there are really two ways that you can take control of the situation when it comes to feedback. You either uh, build up rapport and a relationship with the recruiter uh, involved, because that's the person you'll have the most frequent touch points with, mm-hmm. um, and make them like respect you. So like if they hit you up, it's, it's when you, when you, if you hit them up, you have that kind of rapport and relationship where they can have a real conversation with you. Cause part of this, part of the feedback hesitation, hesitation too, is there's this perception that if you don't give feedback back correctly, somebody might try to sue you for it. Right. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if that's happened in the nineties when like people were suing McDonald's over like hot coffee and shit, <laughs> but like, that is that is that is actually a, a perception. So people have to be careful with how they how they they give um, feedback because they have that perception. So like if you're building a, a rapport relationship with somebody, they're gonna feel like they have they can actually have a conversation with you, and it can be a real conversation, and you're not gonna blow up on them for it. The other thing is to make them fear you, and by fearing you, I mean by building up your personal brand. You know, you don't have to be you don't have to be like. Uh, 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 a tech influencer or have a large <laughs> following, but you have to be visible, right? Yeah. Because right now companies are super protective over their employer brand. So somebody with enough visibility or engagement, all it takes is one bad post um, to kind of like flip the whole entire table. Like, yeah, I'm not, I, and I, I'm always like, Put always be careful of like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Y'all for my name, put some respect on it. Put some respect on it. Always be careful. Always be careful and be mindful of like any actions because uh sometimes you can burn a bridge, but sometimes you want to burn a bridge to send right. a message. Yeah. I think you got to. Uh that was that was excellent. That was a good um a good reply for that because you know, I, I hate it for people. I, I've been through it. And like the like the thing you wrote about, you did all the jobs so you can identify with people. Like I said, I feel like I do too. Like I always tell people like I ain't start off like where I'm at now, you know, I'm still working to get better or whatever. So, uh, that was dope. And so now the the fun part is, uh, mm. so it's, so we know on Facebook, we had this thing with the recruiter swindler and what she was charging people to review their, first of all, the right resumes. Well, first of all, we're starting like this. She was infiltrating Black Tech Twitter for one. On top of, I already seen how big her following is on LinkedIn. You know, preying on entry level people, pretty much saying like this resume will get you a fang job, not an interview, but a fang job. 
on yeah. top of doing, I think, some resumes for like $1,000. Um, and she got called out for being a fake because they found out that she had been fired from Amazon and was ineligible to be rehired weeks ago. Yeah. And posing as different people. Like she's like these Ted talk people and all this other stuff. Uh, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that when it comes to that going on in the community? Because I'm not going to lie. One of the reasons I did step away why I just mostly tweet off of my pixel because my pixel is my business phone. I'm not every day. Uh, my Pixel, I use a buffer to do most of my, my third party tweeting. It's because like all the the nonsense that that I see unfortunately having to go on with black tech Twitter a lot. Where I'm just trying to post and get off or you know, help people. I'm not trying to always be in the ignorance, even though um what 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 Drake said, like I went blind, you gotta hand it to me. Like I, I won't, you know, I'm a fireman, I'll run to the smoke if I got to. But for the most part, I try to stay out the way. And I want to say this is one of the reasons, but it starts leading into a whole bunch of other chaos where it starts off with a recruiter. Then all of a sudden now everybody wants to get on everybody who charges for a service or something like that. They want to say, Oh, it should just, everything should just be free and all this other dumb stuff that they say in those spaces that doesn't make any sense. And it's always us. Like I get it. We, everybody wants to help everybody what you can, but, People have to realize time is money. If people are spending their time to help you, they should be compensated that. But make sure this person is a person that has the skills that they say they do and they can be verified, you know, check out the testimonials and all this other stuff. But I'll let you chime in on that before we, you know, wrap that up. Because I, I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. I, I, I did the little Mr. Krabs meme when I came on to uh, Twitter when I was like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it was, it was an unfortunate circ- situation to be honest with you. Um, people already have a tenuous relationship with recruiters and we don't have the best reputation in a lot of spaces. So I, I did, I did feel for, for a lot of people that, that like were engaged with her or like, you know, that have caught like some, some um, debris or collateral damage. Um, I do think that there is a difference though, like between scamming people, there's a huge difference between scamming people and charging for your time and services. Um, I wouldn't care. I don't, I like, I saw, like I saw the price that she was charging people and I honestly wouldn't have had a problem with her prices. And like her prices are significantly more than mine uh, for reference. And I had no problem I have no problem with any price that someone says. Someone could set a resume for ten thousand dollars, right? Right. If if they set that resume and somebody buys it, that's not my business, uh, because I don't. I I believe that the only person that could really put a value on your time is you. Right. The problem that I have though is any good coach, any any honest coach, or anyone that that's honestly trying to help you, um, will tell you that they can't guarantee you anything, no matter how good they are. Right. Uh, They like a good coach is there to maximize your chances is there to maximize what you give, give them to work with. Right. Phil Jackson was there to maximize Michael Jordan's talent by getting him to distribute it in other ways, such as passing the Mm -hmm. ball and putting more energy on defense than shooting. Right. But Phil never said to Michael, yo, like I guarantee you that we, but if you just do this one thing, uh, if you just if you just shoot, if you just don't diversify, don't work on anything else, and because I'm here, you're gonna you're gonna win. It's guaranteed. Like no, it was always we can do this. You know, we have it in us. We have the skills. We just have to seize it, right? Yeah. And I think there's there's a huge difference there. Uh, when I work with my clients, I I always tell them that like you know, I I will pour all my energy into you, and I will give you everything I got but it's you that's going to do the work. It's you that's going to be in the interview. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do your interview for you. Like people outsource certain parts of their job to me, the resumes, the application process, making the introduction to the, to the, to the recruiter. So they, they can get an interview, but I can't actually get them a job unless they seal the deal themselves because at the end of the day, it's an exchange of value and money. So 
I, I was okay with the prices. I wasn't okay with the guarantees because part of the reason why those, like, I feel like why are these, are these discussions kind of take an emotional turn is because every, like job searching, working your career, it's an emotionally draining, soul crushing and heartbreaking experience. Yes, there are highs, there are successes, but like when you hit a wall, it is the worst feeling. HD, you just said that entry levels are the hardest thing to get right. into tech. And like, it's no surprise that that's where most of the barriers are. But once you break through, you've, you've broken through and it gets easier as you go along. But like, don't get it twisted. It's, it's, it's a really, really hard thing or everybody would be doing it. And you see everybody trying to do it, but it only seems like a few are getting through. Um, so I, I was, I was quite sad again, that like, uh, you know, we had another another prominent recruiter or another just uh, another uh, prominent recruiting uh, moment that wasn't a good moment. Um, right. And I feel for like I feel for us as black people, too, because we are very as, as a whole, I, I like as a whole, I feel like across the world, we are a very inclusive people. Like um, it feels like in a way we almost let anybody into our space, into our culture to profit off of it. Right. And time and time again, people have the wrong characters have taken advantage of that and they've sucked up goodwill or like they've derailed conversations. I don't like that. I don't like that. Uh, I don't like that. The conversations go that, you know, there's a that that people confuse scammer with entrepreneur right. or someone that charges. Right. Right. Um, I sometimes I sometimes I don't I try not to take it personally because I, I know like they're not talking about me because uh, I don't scam people and I and I always make sure I get a fair transaction and my biggest thing is making people happy with what whatever whatever it is they engage with me but like to say like pe- like and in addition to that like a lot of the people that I know that are on Twitter that do charge for their services and that are um, ethical also have a lot of free material on Twitter for you to use. Like a lot of people come to me to to write their resumes. And I have not only several resume templates for them to download, I have a guide, a step-by-step guide that shows them how to write a resume the way that I would write their resume. And they still pay me. And the way I look at it is like, that's an, that's a choice at that. That's a choice for you. Right. Cause I put, I put all, I put what you need to do on it. And some people, would rather just not waste the time because they, they want to, res- they want a result and they want to invest in it because their time is more, they value their time to do something else. They right. value time to spend time with their kids. They value their time to like, to cook, to work out. Right. They value their time because again, this whole entire process is draining. So like wherever they can save themselves a couple hours, a couple hundred dollars that might get them, 10, 15, 20, 50 K increase in salary would be worth it. Yeah. I, I don't complain about the prices. I only complain if, like I said earlier, like if I know you're taking advantage, like, like we said, the entry level people, other than that, I don't care what you charge either. I always say that. I was like, I'm not going to go to the parking lot where they sell, you know, Lambos and Rolls Royces and complain. I'm not, they target demographic. Let me go to where I can afford. That's, that's all people got to do. You know, I only get offended, not offended, but I just like, if I know you're talking about somebody I'm I'm cool with that I personally talk to a lot that I know does good business, I don't like that. I always say yeah. like, you know, like Joe Budden said, you know, if it's not directed, we don't respect it. Like, don't, if you want to say it, put a name on it <laughs> and have your real picture up on Twitter. Don't have a fake picture up and then you just love to talk. Like, you know what I'm saying? People, it's like one thing people could just say stuff, but then when that person you're talking about is getting results, like everybody can't be lying, you know? <laughs> and and that's kind of how I feel about that. Um, but hopefully, you know, people that work with her, they did maybe get a decent resume and maybe they got a job somewhere. Uh, yeah. I hope it worked out for them. I just, like, I just don't know, like I, when I, people get taken advantage of. And mm-hmm. the thing I forgot was, I think it might've been Eric and I, one of our, or, or Ethan might have been the live stream. We were talking about LinkedIn needs to add a feature into where they actually verify that you worked at the place you said you worked. 
that'll never happen. I know, but if it could, I think that'll make it even easier because, like, for example, my background check for the, my uh, the fintech company I work for, I had to go verify them places because some of the places I ain't worked at in years I had to go on the freaking whatever those sites are. I had to go to those sites and put in my dates. I worked on my my zip code and said, "Oh yeah, here you go." I said, "Hey, you see this is where it said I worked." I had to do all this stuff. Yeah, I I think I think that'll help because I can go up right now and say, "Hey, I worked at." Microsoft, I worked at uh, Sony, I worked at uh, Crouch. I could just say I worked at these all these companies, go steal the job description, make up some things I accomplished and act like I'm something that I'm not. The only way to know that is if you were an experienced person and you had a talk with me and say he's that's, lying. That's the whole point of interviewing. <laughs> right, right. But, but that's the thing. I've seen that on on people's like, I mean, other people that's that are prominent, you know, that they got pages and stuff like that and i'm watching the videos and like they don't know what they're talking about yeah yeah. they're just starting off and i I was like i don't have a problem with it just say i mean don't act like you know you're this some experienced senior level person just say hey i'm just learning or or falling in love with people who want to do a certain position but they got the followers so now you listen to them but it's like they haven't even did what they're talking about yet just 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 be off just wait this way yeah definitely uh and so i I just one of those things that hopefully the the twitter community kind of you know does to pay attention to the numbers and all the other so that don't matter pay attention to the quality content and fact check it see if it backs up and like i said earlier research people on linkedin to see if everybody might not answer but some people might be willing to answer and say hey you know this is what i did you know Look for legit stuff. Like I posted some today on um, free resource about if you go to Qualys actual site where you can get certified on some Qualys stuff. So, and I didn't know, like, you know, people, more people do need to check the vendor website because they have all type of free training a lot of times. And that might be a repository I work on or maybe you have one I can share it out. But, um, yeah, I actually have a, I actually have a, a spreadsheet that I put of like cybersecurity resources. Uh, you're actually on it, Joe, funny enough. <laughs> uh, for like people to follow and whatnot. But I, I think, I think the, uh, the biggest thing it, it like to just emphasize when you're building your personal brand, authenticity goes a long way. And like, you could be at any, any point in your career and build a personal brand and also build up a following. Um, there's a, there's a guy on Twitter that I follow named Jay. Uh, I think he goes by data Jay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I, he, I I connected with him when Black Tech Twitter first started, and when he only had like a hundred followers or so, and he has been documenting and collaborating and building community based off of his learning journey. He's not an yeah. he he doesn't he doesn't build himself as an expert. He builds himself as a learner, and he is literally just putting yourself out there in your story, and people relating to that, and that's what he's doing. And I, I would encourage everybody to do that when you're getting started. Just Show where you're at and what you're trying to do and what you want. Yeah, he actually used to be Network Jay. Um, Network Jay, yeah. yeah, yeah. There we go, Network Jay. Because I used to be like, "Hey man, how's the Network Jay?" And then we talked about it briefly. Uh, but yeah, he's uh, he's definitely been uh, killing. Me. He's what's gonna go through, like most people go through when they try to pivot and transition. Um, you know, as long as you just get that. I mean, we didn't even touch on like how. Uh, you know, networking can be, and we might have to part two this thing because, I, like I said, I'll be moving. I'll be moving like in what next month to where I actually have like my own actually office space. I give people the illusion that I'm in the office when I'm doing this, but I actually have my own spot, so it'll be way more quieter than my little girl. I know she's in there getting fussy, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man, I appreciate you for coming through. Uh, want to tell the viewers where they can follow you at. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Jermaine Jupiter, all one word. Jermaine is spelled with a J at the beginning and an E at the end. Um, or you can look at me up at, on LinkedIn at Jermaine Jupiter. Or you can just Google the job father, uh, which is all one word, which is hilarious. And I'll come up. Yeah, I have all his stuff in the description, including like uh, Jupiter HR, um, LinkedIn. Or if you got like a landing page with all this stuff, I had that in there. So uh, the people could tap in with you. But uh yeah, man, I appreciate it. It's been a dope interview. I uh, appreciate everybody for rocking with me. Patreon gang, salute. YouTube subscribers, salute to y'all, man. Um, and y'all know what it is, man. Let's get textual. <laughs>